job stability, election interference, stolen data, and privacy concerns. AI is quickly becoming integrated into our daily lives. But will it do more harm than good? Plus, RFK Jr. on Trump's VP shortlist with a third-party candidate hinted at on X. But first, history is in the making as former President Donald Trump is on trial over hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels, leading into the 2016 presidential election. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. Trump is facing 34 felony counts related to allegations he falsified business records to conceal the hush money payment. This is one of four criminal trials the former president is facing, but the only one that is guaranteed to finish before the upcoming election. But the big question is, how will voters react if he is convicted? It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, Director of Data Science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, thanks for joining me. I want to kick it off with a new Reuters poll that shows 64% of registered voters view Trump's charges as at least somewhat serious. Are we seeing this trial really impact any recent polling no numbers coming out of major swing states? Yeah, no, it's interesting. And that the Reuters poll kind of backs up what we see when we look at some of the cross tabs, right? If you're a staunch Democrat, you have an opinion about the trial. If you're a staunch Republican, you have an opinion about the trial. It's really that middle independent swing, those types of voters. We see that, especially in the non-affiliated independents. They think 50 to 60 percent of them think that if he's convicted, it will affect their vote. Now, again, question wording, all that other kind of stuff. But bottom line, if he's convicted in this case, they're going to at least um, take another look at their opinion of him. You know, we're about eight months away from Election Day, which is really an eternity in modern day politics. Do you think we will see any long term impact to Trump's White House chances if he's convicted? You know, I got throwbacks to 2016 where every week it was a new political scandal with Donald Trump. And everyone's like, oh, this is the week where, you know, whatever he said or whatever he did, this is going to bring him, you know, what the term was political gravity is going to bring him back down to normal. That didn't happen in 2016. That didn't happen during his uh, presidential um, during during his presidency. He had a he had a similar experience in 2020. It was very close. I don't necessarily think that this is going to be the one thing that brings him down or brings most of his poll numbers down. And I think the bounce back. I mean, the trends tell us that he he does bounce back from from stuff like this, especially if he's convicted in something as high profile as this. There's going to be another story the next week. And he's obviously going to campaign against that, which which tends to work for him. So, uh, you know, I, I don't see this as a as, you know, eight months out is something that 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 will stick over seven or eight months, um, especially given how crazy this campaign season is going to be. But this is considered one of the least serious criminal cases the former president is facing nationwide. Are we seeing his base rallying behind Trump or is it starting to fracture? You know, it, it, that's another good, good question. When we combine it with the polling data and the polling data says that, you know, if he's convicted, he loses some of those independents. On, on the flip side, his base, the Republicans, you know, staunch Republicans, they give more money. Now, when you ask them in focus groups and things like that, they do say, that, look, you know, this is this is tiresome. We think these are a lot of them think they are witch hunts. They agree with them, but but they're they're sick and tired of, of dealing with this. There's some weariness, um, sympathetic weariness about it. But by and large, you know, the, these types of things are good campaign rallies for him and he does fundraise around it. So at least it shows that he's rallying his base around this. Decision Desk has President Biden trailing Trump by 0.6 percent. Have we seen any major changes since last week in the polling? Not a whole lot. What I would say is over the uh, over the last month, you know, five weeks uh, s since the State of the Union, this uh, this average has gotten closer. You know, right before the State of the Union is about a point and a half, two points off. And so, you know, some might say, hey, it's only moved a point. But you got to remember, we're having one or two polls a month into this average. So it moving a, a whole point over the course of a month is is a big shift change. Um, I'd like to say it's also cor correlated with the fact that the, the Biden campaign is spending a lot of money now. You know, they're the only campaign up in some of these swing states with some with some TV ads. And now they're not at four, full force like they're going to be this September, October. Um, but Biden is in campaign mode. And so, you know, we're seeing that average tighten. If you want a prediction, 
I think, you know, a month, two months from now, we're going to see Biden probably take the lead as he spends more money. And here's another prediction after that. I think Trump, as he starts spending money, he's going to take the lead back. Like this is going to be a back and forth for the next seven or eight months. I'm glad you brought up Biden's State of the Union because the president is seeing a boost in his approval number, hitting 43 percent in a new poll from the Financial Times and the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. What's helping the president gain momentum with Americans? Does it just go back to the State of the Union or is there something more at play? I, I, he is out there campaigning more. And I think that's that's the big piece here is he is out there spending money. He's out there giving campaign style speeches. He's out there doing campaign style events in some of these swing states. You know, he's been in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin recently. Um, you know, he's out there trying to move these numbers and getting his name out there. Uh, now, 43% is, is is an improvement for him, but it's still well below the 50, which is where you'd like an incumbent president to be. Uh, but this is certainly a whole lot better, better numbers for him than where he was, say, six weeks ago. I want to move on to one of my favorite battleground states, Pennsylvania. Trump was in the Keystone State over the weekend, and Biden is there this week. Who's leading there, and how close is this race going to be? There's a hefty chunk of um, electoral college votes up for grabs in PA. Oh, man, PA is going to be one of those those states, and they sometimes take a little while to count. That is That is one of the states that we're going to be watching this fall. Who's ahead? Look, the polling averages say right now, um, Trump is ahead, certainly well within, well within the margin of error. And that's another state. If we talk about it week in, week out, we could see Biden up one week, Trump up the next. It's going to go back and forth. And it's one of those states, you know, if you ask me to bet on who the winner is, I wouldn't bet because it's too close and it's going to keep going back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on to the third party candidate everyone's talking about, RFK Jr. He posted on X that Trump aides reached out to him about joining Trump as his VP. If this were to happen, and that's a big if, how much of an impact could it make? Oh, you know, I, I chuckled at that. I don't know how true that is. It seems a little weird to me. And I yeah. think that's kind of what the Trump campaign said. But, you know, I love campaigns, right? You got all these these crazy storylines. Story I, right now, the polling RFK seems to take appears to take a little bit more away from Joe Biden than Donald Trump, and, and a lot of it is uh, interestingly enough, it's it's two parts of the of the voter electorate. It's some of these younger people um, looking for a, a real alternative here, or at least you know it appears a real alternative, and it's some of these these much older voters who who identify with with the Kennedy name. And so, you know, if he were to go on the ticket, he'd certainly get a whole lot more profile and a whole lot more, um, uh, you know, awareness among the voters. And once you get that awareness, then people start understanding what his views are. And I think he'll probably tilt a little more Republican as that comes out. Um, I think it could certainly help Donald Trump. Um, I don't know exactly how, you know, whether his 7% is going to go all the way forward. I know that's that looks how it would work uh, on paper, but that's not how it's probably going to work in practice. I do know this. He's probably not going to get 7% nationwide, mm. but even if he gets 1% or 2% in a state like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or something like that, that is going to make a difference. And so, you know, he could be good on anyone's ticket. And so I get I get I get the uh, I get the appeal. Um, I don't think it'll happen, but but it, it certainly makes him a factor. But Democrats still say they're worried about our RFK Jr. making it on the ballot in these additional states. To your point, is Trump's strategy tr to essentially prop up RFK Jr. at this point, and how is he doing it? Yeah, I know. The, look, the, the, the math is this. Right now, it appears that RFK takes more votes from Biden than he does Trump. So if that's the case, then yes, you want to make sure that RFK is on the ballot in states like Pennsylvania, like we just talked about, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, you know, and RFK is, has has shown that he has the ability to, you know, get the signatures and organize and do that. He's going to be on some of these states. So that that's certainly, you know, on paper, that's a good strategy for the Trump campaign um, because the math works out. I don't know how long that math is going to work out because, again, the Biden campaign is spending money. They have a whole team behind, you know, campaigning against him. And as more and more voters learn about RFK's positions, some of them tend to, uh, the Republicans tend to sh shift towards him 
for a couple of different reasons. So, I, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Right now, that math makes sense. We'll see if that math makes sense in September. So speaking of that math, we've been tracking that three-way race between Biden, Trump, and RFK Jr. recently. You know, have there been any significant changes recently, or have you just been seeing, you know, that conventional wisdom that RFK tends to take more from Democrats than Republicans at this point? Yeah, it's right now it's that conventional wisdom. But what I would say this is when we, you know, we talk about RFK almost every week. He's he's a fascinating political story. And now that he's he's getting on the ballot in some places, someone to watch, his average has gone down. You know, when we were talking about him about eight weeks ago, he he peaked at about nine and a half, ten percent in the average. Right now he's sitting at seven percent. So he's gone down quite a bit. Um, you know, if he's, we'll see what the debates, the debate commission and how that works out later this fall. He, you know, if, if rules from, from past presidencies, um, presidential cycles hold up, he needs 15% to enter the debates. He's certainly going to make the argument he belongs in there with less, but his average is going down, um, since we last, you know, he last peaked seven, eight weeks ago. Um, and I think that's a lot because the, the Biden campaign is certainly, um, you know, starting a campaign against him. Um, but he's also raising money. He's going to he's going to campaign. So I could see that bounce up a little bit as well. But the yeah. big trend is he's going down. Yeah, the Biden campaign. I know the DNC is devoting quite a bit of resources also to combating third party candidates. And we know that there's a few others. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. As the world sees rapid advances in artificial intelligence, more and more Americans are worried about the potential risks and challenges associated with its widespread adoption. From job loss to security concerns, people are mixed on whether to embrace AI or fear its onset. Take a look. You got to embrace technology. It, it, sometimes it helps, sometimes it hurts. Half the time, my teachers think that I'm writing stuff with AI and they're really strict about it. So they like automatically assume if I do well, like I'm using chat GPT probably. All this crap that can be generated by AI to undermine businesses, undermine politicians, undermine trust in institutions, that's, that's already happening and that deeply worries me. We're in the medical field, like for research and for you know procedures and getting things done like that because of the shortages in, in workforce, I think it's it's great. The robots, they got the robots coming out that do everything. And like, you never know, they can't trust those things. Joining me now is President and Head of Research for Minerva Technology Policy Advisors, Kevin Allison. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us here today. Tech giants have really come under fire recently for finding creative ways to harvest massive amounts of Americans' personal data for AI. Where's all that data going and how could that data be used maliciously? Well, there's two things you need to train really advanced AI. You need a bunch of semiconductors and you need a bunch of data. And so companies that are working in this space, like you said, have been out there finding ways to get as much data as possible. They, they scrape the internet, they find books, they find Wikipedia articles and other online sources to run through these models, these large language models to teach them to understand natural human language. And that's what allows a system like ChatGPT or other chatbots to take instructions that are given to it in natural language and, and spit out something that, that sounds fluent. And so that quest for data is kind of never ending. To, to move the models forward, to move the state of the art forward, you need ever more data. And so that's, that's a big challenge that a lot of the tech companies in this space are trying to solve by looking for data uh, of all different types and all different sources. You know, a lot of Americans are obviously being introduced to the idea of AI. There's excitement, but there's also some worry. Um, you know, new Chicago Har uh, Harris AP NORC poll showed the majority of U.S. adults are worried AI will increase the amount of misinformation heading into this election. Um, we've already seen how AI can be weaponized in Taiwan's election. How concerned are you that AI will be used to deceive voters this election cycle here in the U.S.? I think it's a virtual certainty that we'll see some malicious actors, whether they're foreign countries or whether it's individuals uh, using AI systems to try to manipulate voters and, and manipulate the outcomes of elections. I don't think that that would be surprising at all. I think it fits a much bigger pattern. We're now in the third U.S. presidential election cycle where digital misinformation or disinformation has been a real issue. 
I think that the bigger question is how much additional challenges or how many how much more risk of of, of misinformation comes from from AI specifically. And there, I think my views may be a little bit different than the consensus. I think we're already living in quite a poor information environment. So I'm personally a little bit skeptical that just more disinformation, more compelling disinformation created by AI is going to make a bigger difference in the election itself. I would be much more concerned about very compelling disinformation used in things like financial fraud. It's obviously something we need to keep an eye on. It's something that institutions need to be robust against and citizens need to be on guard against. But I'm not sure that it's going to be the game changer for this election that some people think it is. Absolutely. And moving on to more polling, a recent YouGov survey shows that 67 percent of U.S. adults say AI needs more regulation. Forty one percent say it needs to be much more regulated. What's being done to regulate AI right now to you know, combat that financial fraud, for example, that you're talking about? Well, the answer is quite a bit. There's a lot of regulation going on, including here in the United States. Even though there is still not yet one U.S. national AI law, there's been quite a bit going on, mostly at the level of different federal agencies and coming from the White House through this executive order, which was passed last October, an executive order on AI that set the entire executive branch in motion uh, on a long list of to-dos around putting regulatory guardrails in place in AI. Now, like I said, that's not been backed up yet by comprehensive national AI legislation, although there is some momentum building on Capitol Hill for this. Uh, it's really been something more that the executive branch is doing through things like federal agency rulemaking or guidance. And these are not uh, that exciting. They don't tend to attract nightly news headlines, but they've actually been quite significant uh, in the different sort of things that the U.S. government is doing on AI and medical devices, or AI in the financial sector, or with the FTC, for example, uh, looking at how businesses use AI and whether that could be construed as uh, misleading business conduct. For example, if a business does an AI system that uses uh, algorithms that are biased. So there's quite a bit going on, arguably under the surface of the national headlines. So when I talk to voters about AI, one of their number one concerns is I'm afraid my job or other uh, people's jobs could be replaced with, you know, an AI function of some sort. How concerned do you think Americans should be about losing their jobs to artificial intelligence? I think that a lot of that concern and a lot of that discussion is overblown. I think mm -hmm. the reason that I think that is because that I think AI is going to disrupt different tasks that we do inside of our jobs and not necessarily, at least right away, the jobs themselves. Now, is that universal? No. Some jobs certainly will be very disrupted by AI. But I think for many people, it's looking at what are the things you do at work? Uh, which of these are very mundane and dull and repetitive that could potentially be replaced more easily by computers? And then what work is left over that's really more value added that will be harder for AI to tackle? Uh, the rise of these sophisticated chatbots has led to some speculation that actually maybe more of these uh, higher cognitive jobs, uh, jobs like creating content or, or really working on new types of music or other things will be more disrupted. I'm a little bit skeptical of that. Companies that I speak to are moving relatively cautiously on the way that they use AI in those higher value added activities. I think the much uh, sort of deeper or a bigger opportunity for companies is to go after that much more mundane work, which these AI systems can tackle more reliably first. So as AI becomes really an integral part of everyday life here in the US and around the world, what are the risks of dependency on AI technology in terms of you know, human beings' cognitive abilities? If you think about um, a junior person in the workforce who's learning the ropes, whether it's in a trade or whether it's in a, a, the legal profession or in pharmacy or accounting, I do think that that raises some interesting questions. If AI is taking on a lot of those mundane tasks that a first year legal associate or an apprentice uh, on a shop floor would usually undertake, how can you as that junior person accumulate the knowledge that you need to really build up your experience and excel as a more senior person in the field? I think that's a real question. I don't think there's going to be any one 
uh, easy or kind of pat answer to that question. I think it's going to take a lot of trial and error. The same thing applies to students. Uh, if, if students are using AIs to write their essay questions in college, how are they really going to wrestle with the concepts they need to learn? I think it will take a lot of trial and error across almost every field of human endeavor to work this out. And it's going to take people taking responsibility for how they learn. And it's going to take companies, educational institutions, and other organizations really thinking hard and, and experimenting with new ways to teach these basic skills that, you know, just like when you stop learning math by doing rote arithmetic and start losing a calculator, you lose something. And I think that's a really key question to think about in the future. So we've talked about the concerns about AI, but there's actually a lot of reasons to be excited about it, right? That's right. And I think we have a we have a lot of forces that line up to lead us to be concerned about AI. We have decades of Hollywood tropes like the Terminator movies and, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. We have a tendency to ascribe human qualities to these AI systems, especially when they they look and increasingly sound human in terms of being able to use natural language. But these are really computer algorithms. They are software. Uh, and I think that to think about the benefits of AI, you've got to think about what are the benefits of software. Well, it makes people more productive. It makes potentially machines more productive, too. And we're now seeing some early empirical evidence about this. There have been a lot of consulting studies that say we're forecasting some tens of trillions of dollars of potential economic benefits from AI. These are kind of finger in the air studies. No one really knows how much economic benefit will crystallize out of this. But some other empirical studies have started to show computer programmers can be twice as effective when they have an AI co-pilot helping them write computer code. If you get that kind of productivity gain across the economy, that's going to lead to a lot more income, a lot more jobs ultimately, and a lot more progress for human well-being potentially if we can get the balance between the risks and the benefits right. Kevin Allison ending us there on a very positive note about AI and what the future holds for it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I recently moderated an event with TechNet in partnership with The Hill, where tech leaders talked about the latest developments in AI technology and the importance of responsible and safe advancements that benefit all Americans. Here's what they had to say about one of the biggest concerns, job security. We have to be careful not to design AI to replace workers, but rather to complement workers, to be a tool that they can use to make themselves even more uh, productive and more valuable. It can actually provide um, services and um, the abilities and capabilities um, where people didn't have them before. Small businesses never had like a marketing director. They never had somebody who could analyze data to actually help them make better financial decisions in a faster way. You have to think about what things can I do now that I could never have done before. Essentially, artificial intelligence is a ubiquitous technology that will appear in everything we do. You've all been using AI for a dozen years, if you've used online search or translate or email. I think what's important is that sort of the experts in those individual domains continue to be the ones who are leading the regulatory efforts on them. The goal is to uh, have a, a, a companion, a tool, an empowering agent, not a replacement agent. Now, The Hill's Raphael Bernal takes a deeper dive into which professions and jobs will be most affected by AI. There are two ways of looking at the AI revolution, tech and economics. On the tech side, it's here, it's happening. The question is, will it be life-changing like the internet itself or an overhyped but ultimately useful technology? Remember Google Glass? 10 years ago, we were only 10 years away from augmented reality for everyone. Segway, 20 years ago, we were all getting ready to zoom everywhere on magic scooters. Okay, that, that, that one kinda happened, but not in the way Segway predicted. And that's the point. These technologies, whether overhyped initially or not, they kept improving and they became part of our lives. But the economic question behind AI hits deeper. Are we all going to get replaced? The short answer is maybe. It's not the first time a new technology comes along to change the workplace. The Industrial Revolution is a typical example. Imagine a blacksmith in the 1790s who's the best at wielding a hammer. And along comes Joseph Brahma and he invents the hydraulic press. And by the way, Brahma also gave us flush toilets, which replaced no one. 
Our blacksmith, he simply can't swing his hammer as hard, as often, or as accurately as the press. So he and five other blacksmiths, they get replaced by a kid who knows how to work the press, right? Well, that's where it gets complicated. The blacksmiths know the process of turning raw materials into finished goods, press or not. In the fairy tale version, our blacksmith learns to use the press and uses it as another tool to make himself more productive. It seems few people are expecting the fairy tale version of AI in the workplace. Wall Street is all in on AI, to the point that some companies have engaged in AI washing, telling investors they're using AI when they're really not. And according to Goldman Sachs, 36% of all companies mentioned AI in their fourth quarter earnings last year. Big companies are hiring more slowly, waiting to see how the AI hype pans out. In short, they're waiting to see who they can replace with robots. And the most at risk jobs are the ones that require exclusively digital inputs and outputs. Think bookkeeping, graphic design, basic customer service, video editing, or document review. The least at risk are jobs that require human contact and interaction or physical labor and presence. That's anyone from construction workers to teachers. But most of us are somewhere in the middle. A news reporter, for instance, needs to talk to sources, but AI can currently write a passable story in a fraction of the time it takes any human, provided that the computer is fed the right information and prompted to write a news story. So will I get replaced by AI? Beats me, but probably not tomorrow. The big difference between the AI revolution and most technological shifts since the Industrial Revolution is it's threatening workers in the knowledge industry. Like the 18th century blacksmiths, digital workers still know how the sausage is made and might be able to use AI to reach previously impossible levels of productivity. But former Labor Secretary Robert Reich is warning it could change the way we work, not just how many jobs are available. Reich says AI will ultimately manage the digital economy, paying workers spot auction rates for projects that will be gig workers like rideshare drivers. That's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And we want to hear from you. Leave your comments and let us know what's on your mind.